there are few big challenges left in the world of aviation. Brian Milton is about to embark on one of the longest and most hazardous. In March of this year, he and his co-pilot Keith Reynolds will set out from London in an attempt to become the first aviators to fly around the world in a microlight, the smallest and lightest of all aircraft. The 24,000 mile flight is in the tradition of the great pioneering aviators like Amy Johnson and Charles Lindbergh. Flying around the world in a microlight is a great adventure. It's never been done. It's a very romantic adventure. There are no compromises. It's a human adventure and technology plays almost no part in it at all. I think anyone who knows about microlighting could fly around the world if they took three years to do it and waited only for good weather. The big challenge for us is doing it in 80 days and flying when we know the weather's not going to be very good at all. The route will take them from London to Strasbourg and over the Austrian Alps. They fly down the coast of Italy and across to Athens, over the eastern Mediterranean to Amman in Jordan, and then across the Saudi desert to the Indian Ocean and India. The flight through Asia takes them across Burma and Vietnam to Hong Kong. Then, following the China coast, they fly to Tokyo before heading north to Russia to cross the Pacific via the Aleutian Islands to Alaska. Then it's south to San Francisco and the two and a half thousand mile crossing of the United States to New York before heading north to Quebec, Baffin Island and Greenland within the Arctic Circle. The crossing of the North Atlantic takes them to Reykjavik before the final long leg home to the British mainland and south to London. The GT Global Flyer will challenge the exploits of the first aviators to circumnavigate the world four of eight US Army flyers who did it in 1924 in Douglas biplanes. Eight Americans set off from Seattle 74 years ago this April in four large biplanes specially built for the flight. They headed west with the sun rather than east, which is the way chosen by Milton and Reynolds. In 66 flying days with 351 hours in the air, changing engines five times and wings twice, four of the airmen succeeded in returning to Seattle. No one was killed on that flight, and the last survivor, General Lee Wade, died only seven years ago. Their record, 175 days, is still the fastest ever flight around the world by a single-engined open cockpit aircraft, and a direct target for Milton and Reynolds to beat on the GT Global Flyer. Milton and Reynolds' world flight is sponsored by GT Global, a pioneer in offshore investments and one of the world's major investment fund companies, managing more than $16 billion worldwide for a million investors in the USA, Europe, Canada, Japan and elsewhere. Last year, Investment International magazine voted GT Global Offshore Fund Manager of the Year. We would see ourselves as pioneering investment managers, uh, innovative investment strategies, um, risk controlled, but nevertheless, um, you know, offering high returns for people who are a little bit bolder. And uh, that's been part of our heritage and a part that we're very proud of. It is a pioneering trip. It's a, actually, I think, a brilliant allegory for the kind of business that we are. It has elements of risk to it, as any investment strategy does, but it's, it's a controlled risk, it's a calculated risk, it's a well-understood risk. There is a challenge to it, and, and of course we uh, approach every one of our client mandates with that same kind of a spirit of, of challenge and, and commitment and dedication that this team will have in their round-the-world endeavour. Milton is no stranger to adventures in the most primitive forms of flight. He was one of the best hang glider pilots in Britain in the early days of the sport, and among the first to experiment 20 years ago with adding an engine to the hang glider wing. It nearly killed him.
Milton escaped with two fractured bones and deep bruises, and a lasting anxiety about falling from heights. There have been great advances in microlight technology since Milton's fall, comparable to the advances in mainstream aviation between 1912 and 1932. But the aircraft that he and Reynolds will fly around the world is still pretty basic. It's essentially a large hang glider wing made of sailcloth with a motorcycle engine slung underneath. It cruises at 60 miles an hour with eight hours endurance and can reach heights of 20,000 feet. In their open cockpit, Milton and Reynolds will face extreme exposure to the elements across desert, jungle, and some of the most hostile places on Earth. This is not the first time Milton has aimed for the record books. In 1987, he flew solo from London to Sydney, Australia, as part of that country's bicentenary celebrations. His 13,600-mile journey in 59 days has been in the Guinness Book of Records for years as the longest, fastest microlight flight in history. It was not without incident. The microlight was wrecked on the Greek island of Kythera after being hit by crosswinds on landing. It took five days to glue the aircraft back together. Milton flew on, but a fuel blockage on Christmas Day over the Gulf in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war forced him to ditch at sea. Yet he rescued the aircraft after six hours in the water and got it to fly again in just a week. It's now awaiting a permanent exhibition place at Sydney Airport in time for the Olympics 2000. If the flight to Australia had its moments, the round-the-world journey has similar risks and new and even tougher challenges for Milton and Reynolds to overcome. I think the Alps are going to be pretty rotten getting over those in the early spring. The Saudi desert, uh, lots of thermals are there quite frightening. We may have to go to 12,000 feet. Surprisingly, I don't like heights, but if we've got to go that high to get away from them, then we'll do it. I think Laos and Vietnam will be difficult. There are big mountains in Burma. I think the big problem with the Aleutians and Alaska and later on with Baffin Island, Greenland and Iceland is the cold. We're going to have to fly quite high, 13,000 feet over Greenland, for example, in an open cockpit, and uh, I think we're really going to suffer. So of course there are risks, um, but that is part of the challenge. The risks are obviously associated with the weather, particularly in the mountains, where the weather can change within minutes. And we're flying a very slow aircraft, so we have to uh, make decisions all the time, particularly in mountains, and find a way through. The other major risk, of course, is flying over large expanses of water, and uh, we simply hope that the engine will keep running. Other than that, you know, I'm just looking forward to a great adventure. We know it's going to be physically difficult, but we hope we've got the character courage and stoicism to get by. The record-breaking attempt by Milton and Reynolds will mark the 125th anniversary of the publication of the most famous travel book in the world, Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. Their route will follow, as far as possible, the journey taken by Phileas Fogg, Jules Verne's legendary character. The microlight flight, though, is more complex than Fogg's voyage by train and steamer, with long sea crossings and local politics sometimes forcing major diversions. But like Fogg's epic, fictitious circumnavigation, this voyage by Milton and Reynolds is an adventure that sets man against the elements in the spirit of all the great flights in aviation history. In the age of supersonic travel, for aircraft like the GT Global Flyer, this journey is a return to the human scale of challenges and a forerunner of journeys in the 21st century. <laughs>